Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs> Let us pray. O God, you declare your almighty power chiefly in showing mercy and pity. Grant us the fullness of your grace that we, running to obtain your promises, may become partakers of your heavenly treasure. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from the book of Amos. Alas for those who are at ease in Zion and for those who feel secure on Mount Samaria. Alas for those who lie on beds of ivory and lounge on their couches, and eat lambs from the flock, and calves from the stall, who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp, and like David, improvise on instruments of music, who drink wine from bowls, and anoint themselves with the finest oils, but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, they shall now be the first to go into exile, and the revelry of the loungers shall pass away. The word of the Lord. Thanks be God. The psalm for today is Psalm 146, which will be sung.
the first letter of Paul to Timothy. There is great gain in godliness combined with contentment, for we brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. But as for you, man of God, shun all this. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and for which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Jesus Christ, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep the commandment without spot or blame until the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the right time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords. It is he alone who has immortality and dwells in an unapproachable light whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for those who in the present age are rich, command them not to be haughty or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of the life that really is life. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Jesus said, There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, 
and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried in, buried. in Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us a great chasm has been fixed so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so. And no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that, they may warn, that he may warn them so that they will not also come into this place to torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. This is the Gospel of the Lord. of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, blessed and tender Lord, who is our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Last week, you may recall, the Gospel of Luke brought us one of Jesus' most absurd and perplexing stories of the rich man who charged his steward for squandering his property and fired him for deceiving and stealing from him. The debt then commended the dishonest manager for having acted so shrewdly in saving his own skin. This morning, we are still in the 16th chapter of Luke, but instead of giving us another bizarre parable from Jesus, now Luke gives us one of the hardest, most confrontational stories that the Gospelers wrote down of Jesus' parables. In the first, last Sunday, Jesus encourages his followers to make shrewd choices about their possessions. And during short-term pain for long-term gain, reminding them that they cannot serve God and wealth. While in the second parable today, Jesus exposes the danger of thoughtlessness and complacency that can accompany those who are rich. It reminds us that poverty and disparity between the rich and the poor is by no means a new phenomenon. And more than the Gospel writers Mark, Matthew, or John, Luke is the one who keeps that fact 
a law. Recording Jesus making note of the barn builder to point out the emptiness of building up wealth for oneself. And Jesus refusing to enter into debate with a man who asks about inheritance, telling his would-be followers that they must give up all their possessions and let the dead bury the dead. And overall, focusing on the reversal of fortunes that Jesus brought to this world, setting the tone with Mary's song of God bringing down the lofty from their thrones, lifting up the lowly, filling the hungry with good things and sending the rich away empty. And so when we read the Gospel of Luke, we are forced to consider our attitude towards our possessions and to ask ourselves whether we use our wealth wisely or simply for our own benefit and enrichment. Now, as I mentioned, the story of Lazarus and the rich man is one of Jesus' most confrontational stories. And surprisingly to some, perhaps, it's a story that really has nothing to do with God-fearing believers over against non-believers. And of what happens to the pious and the godless when they die. It's not a story about heaven and hell, although some might insist that it is. Sure, heaven and hell are alluded to, but the story is told by Jesus as a parable. And by, def and, and by definition, details in the parable are made up. They are exaggerations to make a point. Also on the surface, this is a story, a parable about wealth. But as I made note of in my sermon last Sunday, wealth in and of itself is not evil. Rather, what Jesus is seeking to convey here is the danger of becoming blind when material comforts and riches are being pursued. Blindness to moral apathy and indifference, of ability to see human need and suffering, blindness to human dignity and worth. Day in, day out, it is quite likely that the rich man noticed Lazarus the very least that he managed to not trip, trip, trip over him each time he left his house. And maybe he tossed him a coin on occasion or agonized over whether it was a good or a bad idea to give money to a beggar. Maybe he theorized about what kind of poor Lazarus was. Was he a lazy poor or a deserving poor? Was he down on his luck or just a drunk bum? Was he truly sick or was he just pretending? Maybe the rich man said a prayer for Lazarus on the Sabbath or while with his wealthy friends that he brought up the poor for an appropriately abstract conversation about the problem of poverty. But the problem is that none of this is the type of seeing that Jesus calls us to. For you see, according to Jesus, it is to risk the vulnerability of relationships and solidarity to really see. 
to put aside all questions of worthiness and to recognize in the wounds of another my own face, my own pain, my own broken dignity, and my own mortality. To see myself fully in the stories of other people's shame and hunger and fear. To really see Lazarus, the right man needs, the rich man needs to recognize his own complicity that surely may be a part of Lazarus' suffering. Needing to admit that his own inability to say, I have enough, I have more than enough is directly related to Lazarus' poverty. And that his inability to grieve for Lazarus as a fatal sign, it is a fatal sign of the poverty of his own soul. Impoverishment that is such that no amount of purple and fine linen or fancy food can remedy it. And sisters and brothers, <clears throat> this is indeed a radical seeing. The kind of courageous, sacrificial seeing that scares me. And it scares me because it asks so much of us. It asks for everything. And who among us signed up for everything? The scariest part, though, it is that even after death, even after death, the rich man fails to see Lazarus. Privilege. It just stays stuck to him even after death, even in Hades. He piously calls Father Abraham, but refuses to see Lazarus as anything but a servant. Bring me water, go warn my brothers. No wonder that Abraham tells him that the chasm separating the two worlds of the afterlife is too great to cross. And let's be clear, God is not the one who builds the chasm. We human beings, we manage to do that all on our own. And as the epistle tells us this morning, the refusal to confront my own privilege, refusal to bear the burdens of those who have less than me, it's a refusal to take hold of the life that really is. Perhaps this is why Jesus crosses over the great chasm again and again and again, offering us the way forward. A way of selflessness, a way of sacrifice, a way of losing our lives in order to get them. And what else do we require? We have Moses. We have the prophets, we have the parables, we have the life and death and resurrection of the Son of God. Like the rich man in the parable, we have everything we need in order to repent, find grace, and offering healing love to the world. So what does it mean? 
It means really that we are really without excuse to stay inside the gate. I invite us now to affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. That we all may be one. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you. That your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. That they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. That there may be justice and peace on earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. That they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we all talk of the share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others, either silently or aloud. O oh Lord, our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O oh lover of souls. And to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Let us now confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, 
We confess that we have sinned against you, thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. And now, my sisters and brothers, the peace of the Lord be always with you. Please be seated. <clears throat> so wonderful to see you this morning, as always. And those of you who are worshiping on our live stream, although far away, we know you are very close to us here today, and we are delighted that you are worshiping with us. If you are visiting with us today as well, we are delighted that you are here, and thank you for choosing St. Alban to worship today. Good morning. I'd like to say this morning that I'm speechless, but my friends who know me that that's a lie. <laughs> Yesterday was an amazing day. Um, what started months ago, people who donated and worked up in the barn, and then last Sunday we had 25 or 30 people that carried all those boxes over, and then we worked all week and unpacked and everything, and then wonderful people came in and bought a lot of stuff. Um, Right now, the tentative um, um, net amount is right around $6,000 for outreach ministries. Wonderful. And you did that. So thank you. Uh, you're going to see some things left in uh, Farabee Hall. It's divided up between uh, resource warehouse and uh, restore, habitat restore. They'll c come and pick up those things. But thank you so much to everybody that did anything. Thank you. And thank you for leading this effort, Pat. Thank you. Good morning. I'm still talking about the fish fry. Um, we still have some tickets left. We haven't quite reached our limit, so uh, see me afterwards. I'll have a little table outside uh, if you'd like to buy some tickets. Uh, it's on the it's three weeks. It's only three weeks. It's on the 15th, uh, so please come and buy your tickets. Thank you, John. Thank you. For three weeks, I was up here begging. Well, it paid off. Yesterday, that bake sale and these great cooks in this church made $774.75. We just needed that other quarter and we'd have had $775. But anyway, and I thank Rosemary Fisher and Anita Kent. They were there all the way with me. And it was just wonderful. And y'all are the best little cooks in the world. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And for you will talk about next year. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for leading that, Anne. Colleen? Yeah, I was, uh, I was supposed to be in Cancun last week <laughs> celebrating my birthday, which is Friday. And it ended up that my friend who was going with me got COVID. So <laughs> we didn't get to go. So we we pushed that back a month. So I was up. I had told Ann, I said, well, I'm going to be gone. I really want to do something. I had baked some, uh, this is really funny, I had baked some um, fig muffins and put them in the freezer. And I came in, and Jack Crawford had eaten half of them. I didn't, I forgot to tell him. So anyway, but um, I'm just up here to let you know, I told you a, a number of weeks ago that the Castle of Can is, Kansas is coming, and that is the, the campaign that supports eight key agencies in our community. And so it actually will kick off next weekend and Cammie will be sending out information to you. So just watch for her email and then um, you can participate. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Thank you. 
And uh, I uh, draw your attention to uh, other announcements here on the announcement insert. <coughs> <clears throat> Next week, uh, the bishop will be with us here uh, for his parish visit, and he will be confirming uh, 14 teenagers and uh, receiving into the Episcopal Church three adults. So uh, this is going to be a, a, a just a wonderful time of uh, a celebration. Uh, after the service, the bishop then will uh, greet everybody in the parish hall. There will be a reception. Uh, celebrating with the conferments and those who have been received and their families and with you all, of course, and we will find a way to make for you an opportunity to ask uh, the bishop any questions you may have for him there. So, so next Sunday, uh, come ready for some big celebration and then reception afterwards. Now as we come to the second part of the liturgy, Holy Communion, um, we are now moving into um, a, 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 a way, it's hard for me to say this, so bear with me. We are moving now into a different way of receiving communion. Uh, we, um, I realized last Sunday that the way we were coming down here when I'm just alone serving, that this is really the last piece where you should be hurrying up. And I felt that I was running a sprint, giving everybody communion as fast as I possibly could. A better way to do this is to go back to the altar rail. And yes, COVID is around us, but it is becoming less threatening. I mean, it is, it is still, but, you know, we are heading in a similar direction as we had with the flu. So it's time to adopt a little bit. And so what we are going to be doing this time around is... You will be invited as pre-COVID to come up to the altar rail. You will receive the bread from me, and then you can either take a sip of the big cup for wine, or following the big chalice is going to be a smallest chalice, smaller chalice into which you can intinct if you rather would like to do that. Or you can do simply as I do, only receiving in one kind, which is just as legitimate as receiving in two kinds. And so it is perfectly fine to receive the bread alone. So that is one way that we are going to invite you up to the altar to do this, to receive communion. If you would rather like to receive a blessing, you come up to the altar rail as well, just to cross your hands over your heart. Or, if you choose to sit in the pew, meditate, and pray, that, of course, is perfectly acceptable. Let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Oh, 
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you, in your mercy, sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. And therefore, my sisters and brothers, this is the table, not of the church, but of the Lord. It is made ready for those of us who love God and for those of us who wish to love God more. So come, you who have much faith, and you who have little. You who have been here often, and you who have not been here long. And for those of us who have tried to follow, and for those of us who have failed, let us all come because it is Christ who invites us. It is our Lord's desire that those who wish to find Christ could meet him through here. Body of Christ in this life of the Lord. Blood of Christ.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. My sisters and brothers, be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Rent to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the afflicted, honor everyone. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, be and remain with you, your loved ones, and all those who God calls you to love, this day and all the days before you. Amen. And now let us go forth into the world in peace, rejoicing in the power of the Spirit.